am very excited about today's video. I have an opportunity to talk to Terry Cole, who's not only a talented psychotherapist, a talented author, a talented podcaster. She has a YouTube channel that is second to none, and she brings her clinical knowledge, her psychotherapy skills, her charming personality to everything she does. And if you wouldn't mind, could you introduce yourself? I would love to. And thank you so much for that incredibly generous intro. You yeah. are Adele. I have been a licensed psychotherapist for almost 24 years. My focus is on relatedness, relationships, love. And most recently in the past three years, I've focused a lot on boundaries because I think that a lot of times, especially women who are have the disease to please or who are afraid to be rejected, think that creating boundaries means you have to be mean, it means you're rejecting someone, it means you're having a massive confrontation, a big blow up, which of course it does not. So today we're going to talk about a subject that is near and dear to both of us. Take a guess. Boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> I've been writing a lot about it lately, especially for my upcoming webinar, The 50 Shades of Narcissism, Narcissistic Abuse, and How to Survive It. So I wrote this book, The Human Magnus Center, to explain why codependents always fall in love with narcissists, and it's a different angle. Most content that talks about the narcissist codependent relationship want to blame the narcissist. They put too much sympathy on the codependent. And in my work, I put the equal responsibility for both of them. And if you are a codependent and you keep choosing the wrong person or have a broken finger, or as my dad would say, fall in love with a soulmate and later end up with a cellmate, then you have to take a stark look at your responsibility. So my interest in boundaries comes from my upcoming book, The Codependency Cure, that talks about how to manage the process of going from codependency or self-love deficit disorder to self-love abundance. And in that process, invariably, the relationship with narcissists fall apart and the codependent has to extricate themselves. From that point of view, my post-human magnet syndrome work, the codependency cure work, is focused on teaching people how to untie the knot of their self-love deficiency to become self-love abundant. And it requires a knowledge of boundaries about them, how to use them effectively, and also how to not get your hands tied behind your back, how to escape the gaslighting and manipulation. So setting boundaries, understanding boundaries is crucial to this work. Your work was very inspiring to me always. Similarly, and we use different language, but, but looking right. at the, the dance, you know, and a lot of this for me was Harriet Lerner's work about talking about the dance. Right. And seeing that, and I would always say this to clients long before I had any public platform that, you know, you are exactly 50% of every relationship that you're in because that is literally right. the only thing that it can be even if the other person is acting terribly, since what you can do is what's on your side of the street, let's figure out what you can do, which is exactly what your codependency cure is sort of about, focusing in. When you're a codependent though, you've been so trained right. to focus out that that is a whole process unto itself, is looking in and not in a way of, shaming ourselves or feeling terrible about ourselves, literally saying this could be empowering because the one thing I can change in this whole dynamic is me <laughs> and is not them. And I can't control, you know, I, another thing though, Russ, I want to get your two cents on this actually, because I've been thinking about this for a long time about codependency is that there's this covert control. And a lot of times from the outside, like optically, not everyone gets that codependency, there is a lot of desire for control. We are trying to control outcomes, um, avoid conflict, whatever. But a lot of times people will have the idea like, oh, a codependent is like a weak-willed person. They are like dependent on the other person. But we're really talking about a certain level of um, covert and overt control, bidding for control. In what you're teaching with the codependency cure, how do you suggest or think about that that people should can turn that around a little bit and and put it on themselves my codependency cure work is successful because it gets to the root of the problem and dynamically and progressively it builds the person up from the inside heals the wounds the trauma and all that other aspects i mentioned 
so that when you get to the point of teaching them about boundaries, helping them understand boundaries, they are ready to implement them because boundaries do not work with codependents who are in relationship with pathological narcissists who have not had this core trauma, shame, loneliness, addiction issue. So it's either setting it and having some successes, setting it and believing you're successful when you're not, or setting it and having no successes. So the SLD is, and I call this the codependency delusion. They believe they can control the narcissist, and part of that control could be setting a boundary. But you can't set a boundary with a person who does not respect you and does not see the necessity of it. And the only way that they will listen is because of the threat of loss or consequence. So to answer your question, I love it. And codependence, the act of codependence, believe they can control someone, modify their personality to get someone to love, respect, and care for them. And it's just, like I said, a hamster wheel phenomenon. It yeah. can't work and it doesn't work, which is why I say, and it usually shocks people, boundaries do not work with pathological narcissists, people with personality disorders, narcissistic personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, yeah. or borderline personality disorder. All the cluster Bs. Yes, cluster Bs. So... That is the long version of, um, of how this myth that SLDs or codependents could control pathological narcissists, they can't. And, it, and it's the belief that they can keep them in this wrestling ring. You know, George Bernard Shaw said, don't wrestle with pigs, you'll get dirty. And beside the pig likes it. <laughs> they, keep exactly. with, they keep wrestling with these pigs and think that they can beat them. I loved all of that. Let's bring this to self-love deficit disorder. Like just let that sit. Okay, so we got it because it is an absolute reframe and it's a revolutionary reframe, in my opinion, on this concept and on what codependency really is because it literally is a GPS being like, look, you think you need to focus over here. Hi, when we call it this, you're like, oh, deficit of self-love. I guess I should be focusing right. over here. So that's amazing. In my Boundary Boss book coming out in April, the chapter called Boundary Destroyers is all about the cluster B personality. And basically right. it is saying the regular rules don't apply. Exactly. So don't try and stop projecting onto the person who has this personality disorder in your life that they are like you because they're not like you. That's specifically why they chose you, mm -hmm. right? So back to the dance, we need someone to lead. So if you look at the way it is with narcissists right. and codependents getting together, you've got the narcissist being like, hey, I want it to be all about me. And I want you to organ, I'm the son and you, you are organizing around me. Right. And the codependent's like, amazing. Can't wait to make it all about you until it's no longer amazing. So that can happen in X period of time every relationship, couples, situations mm -hmm. cycle differently, but we know there's going to be a cycle of, you right. know, there's going to be the devaluation, the discard, and then the maybe trying to get you back. Actually think about what that means because it's true. When you were saying before about how it's like, why you call it the human magnet syndrome is because you are literally magnetically, it's like this vortex of, eventual hell but in the beginning too you have this um experience as you know described to me by many many clients and many many things that i've read of you know the perfection the everything's amazing like oh my god they made me feel so special and of course a narcissist is saying to the codependent partner i mean you would have to be that special to be with me clearly you're the only one who understands me because i'm so effing special rules don't apply to narcissists and same thing in relationships. So I think that with, let's talk a little bit about how boundaries differ. So you have a particular way, if you're in a relationship with someone who most likely does not have, they could be difficult, they might have anger issues, but you know, a diagnosable narcissist or any of the other cluster Bs, that is particular. That is not your average relationship. No. And so when people are looking at codependency and what, if they're not looking at your work, they're looking somewhere else. They're getting information about boundaries, but that are not helpful or codependency, but it's not 
the same because, you know, you can be codependent with people who are not narcissists, obviously. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's something about maybe we should um, line up. What does it look like to have healthy boundaries in a regularly dysfunctional relationship? (laughs) And how can people change that um, strategy up when they're in, they know they're in a relationship with any kind of a, a real personality disorder as we have described? What do you think about that? To answer that question, it's not about having healthy boundaries. There's, there's no such thing, from my point of view, of healthy boundaries and unhealthy boundaries. People who are what I call normal, self-love abundant, which means you have problems, you might struggle, but you're not saddled with this trauma, core shame, loneliness-based problem that keeps you so bogged down that the only love that feels normal is the love that comes from a narcissist. I could teach boundaries all day long to a codependent, an SLD, or for that matter, if I work with narcissists, and it would not take because the underlying, what you and I call psychodynamic forces, the forces that come from the way we were raised, our childhood, our our relationship templates, our, our formative years, they create this feeling of, do you love, respect, and care for yourself? Or do you have this self-love deficit disorder? If you have SLDD, codependency, the boundaries don't work because you fall in love with. So you're talking about the conscious level, which is very real, but what makes the human magnet syndrome such a I think, powerful concept, it's the chemistry, the unconscious influences that match up two broken, traumatized, lonely, shame-based people, and they fall in love and it feels perfect. It's a story of every SLD or codependent. If you try to teach a person, an SLD, a codependent who's not in treatment for what I would call the underlying issues that created their SLDD, the boundaries don't stick. Not so much because they're afraid to set the boundaries because if they're successful, they'll lose the person that they actually love. The boundaries don't stick for that reason, but more importantly, the boundaries don't stick because they are placed upon a person with a personality disorder. And let's say narcissistic personality disorder. These individuals, by definition, do not know they have a problem. They project their problems on other people. So they can't see their own problems, but they see them in other people. They manipulate. And if you set a boundary to a person that thinks you're wrong, that thinks they're right, you will only reluctantly get them to adhere to it, but it won't be because they understand, respect, and believe it's necessary. So my experience is SLDs try to set boundaries to the people that are least likely to process, adhere, and follow them. And so that the training that I give, the training that you give, sticks when we talk to people who are outside of these relationships, outside of the psychological forces that cause self-love deficit disorder, where they're no longer afraid to set boundaries, where they believe that it is worth the risk to set a boundary. And if someone leaves, you'll be okay. You won't be lonely. And because of the human magnet syndrome, healthier people fall in love with healthier people. They're still opposites. It's not all black and white, narcissists and codependents. The control that is exercised with codependents is futile because they can't really play it out to its extreme and they apply it to people that won't listen, don't respect, or at at best listen, but only for manipulative or self-serving reasons. And once a person resolves or let's say reaches what I call my codependency cure, then the boundary information is so important. I will recommend every one of my clients who get through my stage six, I have a 10 stage treatment program. Your book is going to be mandatory reading because at that moment of time, it will not only make sense, they will want to apply it, but they will apply it to people that actually have the capacity to listen. I agree with all of what you just said. If the original wounds, if the original injuries, if the self-knowledge of the codependent never deepens, if their desire to fall madly and deeply in love with themselves, fill up their own bucket to the best of their ability, have that some self-esteem, enough self-worth to realize that they want more, than this hamster wheel that you would describe before. So you're right, it's the same reason I feel like it doesn't make sense. In the book I give, towards the end of the book, I give a lot of scripts. Yes, and they're excellent, I love them. Thank you, that took so long because part of it is people all want scripts and and they want this instant, that everybody wants the magic pill, the magic bullet. And even with the stuff that I do publicly, and I'll give like 
sentence starters, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. But I also say, listen, I can give you all the perfect, exact, right words, but it still won't stick because the underlying, you know, the cracked pot finds the cracked lid and the cracks are still there, even if we dress it up with some nice words. I always get this question, can narcissists be codependent? Narcissists and codependents are distinctly different and can never be the same. What I did in the human magnet syndrome book, and this is before I came up with the self-love deficit disorder, is I simply defined codependency because there are books upon books upon books about codependency. And no matter who you talk to, everyone has a different opinion. So codependency is so diverse and it's so impacted by personality. Personality is independent. You can be gregarious and controlling. I call that an active codependent. You can be passive and disassociated. I think of uh, Edith Bunker of All in the Family and where you are the salt of the earth, my grandfather. You can be what I call a cerebral codependent where you believe that books and podcasts and videos and all this intellectual information will save you. You can be the oblivious codependent where you just bury your head in the sand and just close your eyes to everything and just try to pretend it doesn't exist. And lastly, you can be what I call the anorexic codependent where you just turn off what I call your romantic intimate machinery that genetic, biological, human urge to be romantically, intimately, sexually connected to a person. Because every time you do that, you're with a narcissist. If you turn it off, you'll give yourself a sense of control. So what I want to say first is that codependency is not a personality trait. You can be a liar and a cheater and be codependent. You can be honest and codependent. You can be drunk. You can be a manipulator. And here is the definition of codependency. It's a problem of the distribution of love, respect, and caring in a relationship. A codependent gives all or most of the love, respect, and caring, LRC, in relationships. And of course, because of human magnet syndrome, these relationships are going to be with narcissists. And they expect it to be mutual or reciprocated. It's not. They try to make it reciprocal or mutual. They can't and they stay in the relationship. That simple explanation cuts across all types of the codependents, SLDs, and the narcissists need all the love, respect, and caring, have no intention of reciprocating, don't believe they should, and never get called to the carpet. So when we understand it in that simplistic term, we can see that codependents, as varied as they are with personality types, all are trying to get someone to love and respect and care for them. They pick the wrong person, and that person has no intention of returning it. When codependents ask me, you know, I think I'm a narcissist. And first of all, my reaction is you can't be a narcissist because one, you're, you're worried and upset that you might be, and narcissists <laughs> don't do that, and you're probably gaslit. There's a lot of people out there that are saying an inverted narcissist is a codependent. It doesn't make sense because we need to understand that more simply we can define codependency and understand and, and take it away from our personality trait, the more we can see it. Narcissists do not give love, respect, and care unconditionally. Codependents do. It's so important to tell codependents that they are not and never can be narcissistic they have too much empathy and too much ability to listen and sacrifice. And when they want to do something for themselves, they learned as a child and all the way up to every one of their romantic relationships, then that's selfish. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. And I see, and I, the truth is that you're making a distinction. If, if you're looking at it just from the need point of view, does the narcissist need the codependent? They do. They both need each other. Of course, this is why the dance is so compelling, but because a lot of my um, clients and women in my groups, they're women. And it's like this myth about like the strength in a way of the narcissist. And yet there's a reality that it is a mutual, a mutual need. So they're doing a dance. Both are getting this need, quote unquote, filled. But for one, it is like at the expense of self and continues right. to be at the expense of self. And for the other, it's like the lifeblood, if you're the narcissist, that care, that that nurturing, that think yeah. of me and centering on me is the how, how you're breathing. It's how you are getting through life. You know what I mean? I'll use a simple analogy. Vampires, they need to suck the blood of others in order to live. So they drain the life source of a person. They hypnotize the person 
so that they offer their neck and then they make them come back every night to give more of their blood. And they live on the blood and with people who are hypnotized to give the blood. That's a good analogy though. I feel like, because it is like being hypnotized. You say, I'm not going to continue doing this. You say, this is it. No. And then the person's like, you know, that was a good sweet potato that you made tonight. Thanks. And you're like, oh, it's on. We're back. I'm back in the good graces. You know what I mean? Oh like, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that is the covert narcissist or the narcissist with sociopathic tendencies because yeah. uh, narcissists who understand how to manipulate and do it consciously are perhaps the most dangerous ones. Right. So it's, like imagining that longing and striving and love go like this when you're young. So it's like there's this melding of the two. And so then you identify striving like crazy all the time, working your ass off to be recognized, to be appreciated, right. to be loved as normal. And so I always look at the, the blueprint, the unconscious material of how did it get that way? How is this familiar to you? And when we can bring that up, and obviously in both of our work, we do this, when you can bring that unconscious material from the basement, as I call it, to the main part of the house, you now there's a chance to be like, oh, you mean love doesn't have to be like that? Or, yeah. you know, boundaries do not have to be like that, or anything doesn't have to be like that. But so much of the time, we don't really know we have a choice. We're just I mean, like, that's the way the world is, you know? One of the reasons I so thoroughly enjoyed your book is that you had what we call a psychodynamic point of view, that our abilities to set boundaries or our struggles with boundaries are connected to our, the large view to our childhood. If you have this attraction, or what I call relationship template, that comes from a, a childhood in which there was severe trauma because of a narcissistic parent, all you know and all you've experienced is loving someone that doesn't love you and chasing that. And so you fast forward that and you come to your adulthood with what I call relationship template. The chemistry that we all experience, healthy people and unhealthy people, is the unconscious matching of personalities. And you won't know what to do. You will feel awkward and intimidated by healthy people. If you run into someone who's another SLG or codependent, they'll feel like a brother or a sister. But the narcissist, you'll feel their pain, you'll understand their pain, you'll want to take it away. So when we are teaching boundaries, and we have to deal with the unconscious material, first of all, the unconscious material is disassociated for a reason, and is very difficult to get to, which is why I created my healing the inner trauma child trauma integration method or hitch. And so what I'm getting to is that the unconscious material exists in both the narcissist and the codependent. By nature of a personality disorder, it's virtually impossible in psychotherapy to first of all, get a narcissist to talk about it, let alone get them in psychotherapy, but to get to that unconscious material, which is why they are narcissists and have personality disorders. But it's extremely difficult and 99% of all therapists have no idea on how to break through the unconscious material, the disassociated trauma. We have that unconscious material, but the brain protects it from coming forward. And so the challenge that you and I have is to connect people to material, childhood memories that the brain is fighting to keep offline. And when we can get to that, and when we can help heal what I call that inner trauma child, and move them forward, then you and I are working with someone who is primed to learn boundaries. They don't have that unconscious material pulling down at them that they're not aware of. And that is when your book is going to change lives with my clients, or it's going to change hopefully millions of lives. Yes, I'm, I'm hoping that it's going to be this, you know, this wide swath it, of people going, absolutely. yes. Like I, I need this. And I think that the demystification though is an important part of this process. What is it that they think that it means to effectively draw personal and professional boundaries, especially as women, we really have been yeah. indoctrinated into this entire experience of if you can just be selfless enough, you're considered a good person. It is like we are raised and praised for being self-sacrificing codependents. In reality, we are, even just in the regular way, not necessarily with narcissists, but right. all of this external focus to get our value. And the reality is that a healthy relationship, a healthy life, a healthy relationship to yourself, you have got to know who you are. What are your preferences? How, how can you prioritize your preference? And why is that bad? Like so many women in my life who I know are like, I'm easy. No, no, no fuss, no muss. I'm like, why are you saying that? Why we gotta be easygoing? How about we just be honest? 
you can't expect boundaries that are taught and have it stick if you don't get to the fundamental belief that you will be okay by yourself. And that's self-love abundance, that if someone doesn't listen to you, someone doesn't love, respect, and care for you, and you set a boundary and they say no, if you're an SLD, you can't ever be alone because being alone is connected to your core shame and the loneliness is so painful. And if you do have self-love abundance and you love that person, the probability is really high because the human magnet syndrome, they're not going to be a narcissist because that's just how it is. But you just have what I would call normal problems that require interventions such as yours, yes, it'll work. But if you're an SLD, learning to set boundaries are okay, but you have to be able to be psychologically healthy enough, have self-love abundance, to basically call the relationship off if you are chronically setting boundaries with a person who is chronically not listening to us. So I call this approach, not yours, but other people's approach, Band-Aid therapy, well-meaning psychotherapy, that teaches people stuff, good stuff, stuff that would work with most people except SLDs, it falls off because the underlying unconsciously based problem is so much bigger than their motivation to set boundaries. And your stuff, it's inspiring because you talk about childhood, you talk about programming, you talk about family of origin, you make reference to unconscious material. And people in my program, your book will be mandatory reading because it will come at a time in my stage six when they have the psychological foundation upon which they can learn these boundaries and not be afraid of the potential of the relationship to fail. I appreciate you saying that. I always say like self-love is the path and the only path to any other healthy love. Creating this, this course on love for women basically mm -hmm. The entire course called Real Love Revolution is based on this notion. But when I promote it and when I do Facebook ads for it, I, I don't say, hey, you're going to learn how to love yourself because everyone's like, yeah, yeah, sure. I got that. But what else? What are the tricks? What are the tips? What are the strategies? You're like, no, actually, that's, that, that, that's honestly, that's the basis. And then we can move from there. Self-love is not... Um, a feeling. It's a way of life. You are literally setting the bar for every other relationship in your life with your relationship to yourself. If you look and say, all right, who's a kid that I love? All right, let me think of a kid that I love. If the way that you are treating yourself, you would never treat a child that you adore, then your self-love needs some attention. Right. And this shifts because as we raise that bar, and this does actually come into this whole conversation with boundaries, because there's got to be a certain level, whether you mean to or not. We're endlessly telling people, I'm handing you the manual on me by the way that we interact, by the way that I respond to you, by what I do and don't deal with from other people, whether I speak up and say, hey, I actually didn't like that. You have good self-esteem. You can say, hey, you know what? I disagree with that. Let's talk about it, right? right? That is having a certain amount of self-esteem about your knowledge, your brains, what you're doing. But if you don't, you can't. You think that. You think, go, oh, no, nah, I don't think that's accurate. Whether you do it nicely, whether you do it judgmentally, it doesn't matter. When you feel okay about yourself, you're not so fragile mm -hmm. that you're like, wow, if she disagrees or if that person disagrees, I'm going to literally evaporate. Right. I'm going to die. I'm going to no longer exist. And so self-love has everything to do with what you can do. And with boundaries, it is this, it's such a fundamental piece within the book. Every single chapter in the book, I've got self-care stuff that I think is real self-care stuff. I've got self-love ideas. How do we build that and there are definitely actions that you can take, but you've got to spend time. I keep going back to how important your work is to the general population for all the reasons that you talk about. But with the population I work with, SLDs, codependents, the self-love, the foundation of it is unconscious. If we were lucky enough, we were raised by normal parents who made mistakes, who unconditionally loved us. We came out of our childhood without attachment trauma and core shame. Yep. But if you were raised in a very dysfunctional, traumatic childhood with a pathological narcissist, you came out of it with an, a, a relationship template and the experience and the cause of it, you can't get to in psychotherapy. It's hidden, just like if you are a PTSD victim 
and you, your best friend was killed right in front of you, your brain puts it offline and you can't get to it. Your brain will fight any attempt to get to it. And that's the basis of PTSD. Well, attachment trauma is PTSD-esque. So when you have self-love deficit disorder, at the bottom of it is attachment trauma. Next uh, layer is core shame. Next layer is this pathological uh, loneliness, this bone-aching existential disease. And mm -hmm. the next part is this addiction to relationships that keep the loneliness away. And then on top is the codependent SLVD. So when they go to your workshops, your trainings, read your book, your workbooks, the SLD goes, oh my gosh, this stuff is brilliant. I love Terry. But they go back into their relationship and should they try to do it, of course, it's with a person with a personality disorder who's going to say, you're crazy, Terry's crazy, Ross is crazy. And no matter how much they want to and believe in the efficacy and the strength of the material, it falls flat. So I am committed in creating this treatment program, as I call my codependency cure. By the time people get to stage six, that undercurrent truly of the attachment trauma the shame, the loneliness, the addiction is gone. And they can do exactly what you just said, what you brilliantly articulated, and it will stick. And by the way, then it's still difficult. <laughs> yes. Because you're now you're consciously rewiring all the things that you talk about magnificently in your book. There's all those challenges still, but there's a foundation that could support them. And that is why I think your material is so important. And I think the combination of my work and your work with my demographic yes. is now cemented. Luckily, we're both able to do something in the world that we feel like will, you know, my whole life is just how can I help you lessen your own suffering? Right. And everyone listening, everyone watching, this is really not something that anyone teaches us, not at home right. or not in school. And if you're a woman, we were taught the opposite. You know, we were right. taught that to do it means that you are not being, you're not feminine and you're not, you're not a good woman, so to speak. Right. And that's not true because to bring our best selves to our relationships and to our jobs, to really step up and bring what we can to the world, which is so important, we can't live small, which right. is when you have crappy boundaries when you let people run you over or when your boundaries are too rigid and you're isolating and you're like, I don't need you. Like you don't, you don't want to do it. My wife peace, right? There, there's all different archetypes within the book and in all the stuff that I teach about. So people can really identify like, Oh, wow. So much of the time people think if they have really harsh, rigid boundaries, they're like, no, I'm a boundary boss. I'm like, you're not, you are not a boundary boss you are, your boundaries are too rigid. So right. I hate, I never want to go between the good and bad. Right. The reality is functional and dysfunctional. Yeah, you made me think of, and I'm going to bring this up again about the codependent SLV personality types. The active codependent is really good at setting boundaries and they set them all the time and they set them again and again because they're setting them with a person who doesn't listen. It goes back to a statement I said earlier, you have to have enough self-love abundance to walk away from a relationship should it not be good for you. I came up with a concept that I call relationship math. Codependent and narcissists are considered half people because of their psychological problems. They're not fully developed. They need a relationship in order to feel whole. And when an SLD and a narcissist meets, the limerence or, or the love and the chemistry and connection is just off the charts magnificent. A half and a half, an SLD and a narcissist equal one, and one is a half of relationship. The SLD and the narcissist need the relationship in order to feel good about themselves. Therefore, they will withstand, especially the SLD, all the bad, uh, uncomfortable, dysfunctional elements of relationship so they're not alone. However, healthier people who are individuated, have self-love abundance, they're ones. They come into a relationship because they fall in love with a person. They don't need the relationship to feel good about themselves. Right. So should the relationship not work, they can walk away from it. The one plus one is two, and two is a full relationship that both people, they don't need the relationship to make them feel good. So when you're like that and you read your book, your life can open up the possibilities because setting a boundary and it not working and trying again and again, you have to be ready to walk away. And that is impossible for SLDs and so possible for all the other people. So I hope that the combination of your stuff and my stuff, your book, 
my books will change the world so they can finally experience self-love and be in love in a relationship and practice and get better every day with boundaries. Absolutely. I'm into that is what I say. This has been so much fun. We need to do it again. I'm, there's so many topics for us that right. I want to discuss with you, but this was so great. I so appreciate your time. I absolutely enjoyed talking to you. And for that matter, reading your book, because we might come from different point of views and have different backgrounds, but we speak the same language. Yours is more general in scope as it should be. For that, I am deeply grateful to be invited on your podcast. Yes. Thank you so much for coming. Take care right on. and be well.